welcome to TEDx Cardiff University, celebrating and sharing some of the best ideas across the university ecosystem. We're thrilled to have so many of you here with us today, and I really, really hope that you're going to enjoy the second TEDx Cardiff University, themed around disrupting the ordinary. My name's Jessica, and I'm here with my co-host, co Mo. Thank you, Jessica. Um, some housekeeping before we start. We're not expecting a fire alarm today, so I will deliver the boring message and tell you that if anything does go off, um, please follow the TEDx team out of the building. And we'd like to thank our sponsors and our partners for really helping us make TEDx Cardiff University a reality. Um, disruption shifts how we think, learn, behave, and go about our day-to-day -day lives. Displacing the existing by creating something new, more efficient and unique. Being both destructive of old and creative of new, disruptors shake up their fields of expertise from top to bottom to achieve extraordinary results. Together, um, we are going to explore how disrupting the ordinary can transform the world we live in today to make a better one for tomorrow. So now for the really exciting bit, our first speaker. Our first speaker is a recent law graduate and an international student ambassador. He is leading a team of students investigating miscarriages of justice as part of the Innocent, Innocence Project. Speaking about how we can all step away from the ordinary and do extraordinary things, please welcome Justin Tong. Hi everyone, feels good to start out. Well, before I begin, you will see this magic number on the screen. Oh, it's here. So we have 441. I would like you to bear this number in mind and I'll come back to this number later in my talk. Ready? Perfect. So you might have realized that I'm not a local. I'm from Malaysia. If we have gone through the summary for my talk today, you will then guess that I might be a lawyer or at least a law student. Well, you are right. I'm a fresh law graduate from Cardiff University Law School, and I'm currently doing my bar training program to be a barrister. If you happen to drop by our law school one day, please don't be surprised to find yourselves being surrounded by a lot of Malaysians. Well, lawyer, is quite an ordinary career choice for Malaysians, or should I say Asians in general? I believe you will agree with me. So there was one time when one of my local friends asked me, well, Justin, why are you guys so obsessed with becoming a lawyer? So I answered her in a way I believe most Asians will do, and I told her, well, you know, back home, it is either you become a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, an accountant, or anything else will be a disgrace to the family. Well, I don't really know how things work here, but back home, if the career choice of yours gives you the chance of making big money, or it could make your mum feel a bit proud at a family gathering, you will probably want to consider that first. Well, of course, it was meant to be a joke. Some of my Asian friends will say it is a lame joke. Well, but most of the time, when people talk about lawyers, they associate lawyers with money and fame. I take this as a negative association. I feel like people are talking bad things about my professional community. And there was one day that I thought to myself, well, I couldn't be the only one who dislikes this negative association. I couldn't be the only one who was defending my professional community. So I went up to Google and I typed, do most lawyers really care about money? And I typed it with such great faith that the answers will not fail me. But the answers turned out to be, yes, we care very much. And there are two lawyers agreeing to this. But there is a caveat to this. You can see I haven't revealed the last part of the comment, and there is a reason to this. Before I reveal it, I would like to run a small reality check with all you guys, just by a quick show of hands. How many of you here believe or think 
that lawyers care about money? Well, quite a lot of you. So what if I say that there is a bunch of lawyers who work for you for free only in the interest of justice? Do you believe they exist? Well, I'm not saying about lawyers who work for you and you do not have to pay them because you can achieve that through legal aid. And lawyers, you get paid through legal aid. I'm talking about lawyers who do their work for you for absolutely nothing in return, only in the interest of justice. How many of you believe they exist? Well, I love you guys. Yes, we do, we exist. And from here you can see it is called pro bono lawyers or pro bono schemes. There are thousands of pro bono lawyers and schemes out there around the world, but I will be focusing on Cardiff University Innocence Project for the talk today. So some of you might ask, what is Cardiff University Innocence Project? What is that? Well, this is a valid question. So we are a bunch of volunteers working under Cardiff University Law School, and we consist of lawyers-to-be, like myself, actual lawyers, academicians, and sometimes actual victims of miscarriages of justice. So what we do is we will take in cases where there could be wrongful convictions or miscarriages of justice, and we investigate into these cases, and then we refer the case to the Criminal Case Review Commission, and they will then decide whether the case should reach the Court of Appeal for a further appeal. And we do all this for free. So our aim is to save people out from places which they never should belong to and to remove their names from a list which could destroy their life when they have done nothing wrong. I will come back to that later as to what it is. And I believe now you might have a lot of questions. What is miscarriages of justice? How does it even relate to the theme of the talk today, disrupting ordinary? So I will first begin with what is miscarriages of justice? In ordinary terms, miscarriages of justice happens when you have been convicted of an offence which you have never committed. It is when you have been punished or sent to the prison when you have done nothing wrong. It is when you and your name is being listed on an offender's register when you have done nothing wrong in the first place. Well, some of you might think that these kind of things happen very rarely. We have ample system, we have solid process, we have gatekeepers to avoid all these things from happening. But I would love to say yes, but I'm not able to. You see, it is very commonly occurring around all of us, and it is ever so near to any one of us here, including me myself, that you could ever imagine. It is not rare. It happens very easily. It only takes someone who hates you to make a false accusation against you. It only takes a police investigation that should be carried out perfectly, but it didn't. And it only takes a piece of law that contains flaws in it that could fail you. And the next thing you know, you will have a case against you, and then you have to uh, go to the court and you might find yourselves, as required by law itself, to spend part of your life behind bars for something you have not done before. And what is more concerning than that, you might agree or not disagree with me, <coughs> prison sentence is concerning. But what is more concerning is that your name is being listed on an offender's register. Prison sentence lasts for a term. But when you find your name in that register, it follows you for life. And for someone who has their name in that list, to live their life in that way is extremely difficult because of social pressure and stigma. You will see from the screen, this is a case of Gareth Jones. This, this case was brought by us to the Court of Appeal last year, and we have got the wrongful conviction overturned. And that means, I'm sorry, and this is a case of sexual offences, but unfortunately, Gareth Jones, our client in that case, has already spent his time in prison, and the purpose of this appeal was to remove his name from the sex offenders register. It is crucial and it is concerning to him because that changed the rest of his life. Well, some of you might think still that no, I'm just making a scene out of something that hardly happens 
It is rare. Again, I would love to say this, but it is extremely regretful for me to disagree with you. Remember the number 441 that I asked you to bear in mind earlier on? You can see from these statistics that this number appears here in this chart. This is a chart released by the Criminal Case Review Commission, the CCRC, back in three months ago, I believe. So how it works for us is that when we take in cases where there could be wrongful convictions, we will then investigate into these cases and we need to find fresh evidence that hasn't been used before in the previous appeals or in the first instance trial. And if we happen to find them, we will then need to refer the case to the CCRC and they will be the gatekeeper. They will decide whether the case has merit and whether the case should be referred to the Court of Appeal for further appeal. And it is then the Court of Appeal's duty to decide whether the appeal should be allowed or dismissed. So for us to find fresh evidence in these sort of cases is hard, is challenging. But for them to refer a case to the Court of Appeal is even more challenging and is even more difficult. But even on that basis, they have referred a number of cases to the Court of Appeal and 441 of them, of these appeals, have been allowed by the Court of Appeal. So what that means is in these countries, in this country, there are at least 441 wrongful convictions made by the courts. And behind this number are at least 441 human beings suffered or are still suffering from miscarriages of justice. And this is just the number that we know that the appeals have been successful. What about those cases which are still pending appeal? What about those cases which we are still investigating? And what about those cases which have not come to light yet? It is concerning. But if this number is not appealing to you yet, the case of Liam Allen is another perfect example they would like to convince you with that, that these kind of things happen very frequently and easily. But I have a confession to make here. When I picked this case as an example, I was a bit reluctant because this is a case of rape and sexual offences. Most of the time, when we think about rape cases, we tend to believe in the complainant because we believe they are the actual victim. Because cases like this rarely comes into light and people don't really report these cases because of shame, social pressure and whatever valid reasons it could be. But this case of Liam Allen is a particular kind of case which I would like to bring to your attention and I would like to say that justice should be done for the defendant. So Liam Allen in this case, he was a university student of my age at that point of time of course. So he was accused by his ex-girlfriend for raping and sexually assaulting her. So when or if you have been accused of raping someone, the complainant's concern might, consent, I'm sorry, might be your best defense. So consent here is the key. So when this accusation was made, police investigations were carried out, evidence were collected, and everything seems legit that the case against Liam was strong and he could find himself behind bars for quite some time. And of course, his name being listed on the sex offenders register. But just when you think that police investigations couldn't go wrong, here comes the plot twist. The defense counsel for Liam, Julia Smart QC, when she was preparing the case for Liam, she somehow stumbled upon a piece of evidence which was not revealed or made known to the defense counsel by the police. There was a list of chat histories in the complainant's phone and the histories were between the complainant and her friends. And in that histories, it was shown clearly that the complainant consented to, those, to all these sexual activities. This piece of evidence is extremely crucial but it wasn't made known to the defense counsel. And in fact, the police did not reveal this information either. There could be thousands of reasons why this non-disclosure occurred, but I will not touch upon them in this talk. It's sensitive. But if 
if this piece of evidence weren't discovered by the defense counsel, Liam would find himself behind bars even until, until today. Well, you might say that, okay, Liam was just the unlucky one to find himself at the wrong place at the wrong time, but eventually, he still found his way out of jail, right? Well, yes, of course. He's not in prison now. But in view of how easy and how, how frequent these cases could occur to any one of us, how many times do we really want Lady Luck to be on our side to save us from prison when we have done nothing wrong? It is extremely regretful for me to say in this open place that nothing in this world is foolproof. But the criminal justice system is probably the last thing you want to see flaws in. But in Cardiff University Innocence Project, we live with the fact that flaws exist. We know it exists, and we also know that there are kind spirits out there who are working hard and toiling to fix these issues. But at the same time, we are conscious that while things are still being repaired, people are still being sent to places where they never should have belonged to. Their names are still being listed on a list which could destroy their life when they have done nothing wrong. It hurts us to see all this. And this is the precise reason why, I believe, most Innocence Project workers and those pro bono lawyers who work with us decide to give up the comfort in life that we could have lived up to and also the chance of making big money to help these people out when their voices couldn't be heard. Well, I know a lot of you here cares about them as well, but we care to the extent where we were willing to disrupt our ordinary daily and career life to save them out from places which they never should have belonged to. It is not rocket science to do what we do. In fact, some might say it is a boring work. We take in cases where there could be miscarriages of justice or wrongful convictions, and it is just hours and hours of reading into case files, case papers, witness statement, statements. Quoting the words by Julia Smart QC, it is like looking for a dog that doesn't bark. And it is. We easily find ourselves weeks and weeks into case files and case papers just to find a single line which carries fresh evidence. And most often than not, we don't. And even if we it so happen to find them, it, there is no guarantee that the case will be brought up to the uh, CCRC and even to the Court of Appeal. And even if it reaches the Court of Appeal, there is no guarantee that this appeal will be successful. It is tough. It is a long line of work. But it is never mission impossible. It is about the willingness to sacrifice and to take a step away from the ordinary comfort in life that all of us could have lived to. As a university student, it is the time when you find yourself in a bar with your friends, sipping that cold pint of beer, watching your favorite football team plays that I and most Innocence Project workers find ourselves within piles and piles of witness statements, case papers, and all sorts of documents. As a pro bono lawyer, it is the time when most other lawyers have their free time to spend with their family, to do things they like, or even to make bigger money that they find themselves traveling hours and hours from London to Cardiff just to have a meeting with us or actual victims of miscarriages of justice for free. But if you ask any one of us, is this worth the while? I believe none of us will say no, because we know deep inside what we do, although small, gives hope to those in despair. So this talk might sound like a, like a big shout out to all those who have chosen to take this path, but this is not the only reason. This talk is also a big reminder to those who are suffering from miscarriages of justice that you are not alone. There are people out there who have chosen to take this extra mile for you and be ever so ready to assist you when you need us. I'm aware that there could be a thousand and one reasons for someone to step away 
from their ordinary career or daily life. But it only takes one to make extraordinary results. I found mine. And it just so happened that my reason coincides with all those Innocence Project workers out there. So my question for you to take home today is have you found yours? Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the talk. I think whether or not we agree that, um, you know, how demanding Malaysian parents apparently are, we can agree that this man's parents did a really good job. Um, amazing work and, yeah, yeah, incredible and very inspiring. Our second speaker is, prof is a professor of finance at Cardiff Business School. Um, his work is published um, in some of the leading academic journals and cited in the media, including the Financial Times and Washington Post. Speaking about how fintech is changing the future of finance, please, um, in a moment, we'll welcome Professor Arman. Just one second. All right, now for the grand entrance. Welcome, Professor Arman Ishragi. Yes, thank you. Right. Hello, um, it's a pleasure to be here. So let's talk about financial technology. Uh, in the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to reveal to you some key insights uh, about fintech and why I believe uh, not just finance professionals, but all of us have to care about how the fintech phenomenon is changing and touching our lives. Uh, but before that, uh, let, me, let me put a question to you. Uh, can you raise your hand if you have a mobile phone right now? So almost all of you, which is not surprising. Uh, but can you guess what percentage of the world's population in 1990 had mobile phones? Uh, so the answer to that is less than 1%, 0.2%. Um, that's a very, very low percentage. Uh, so two in every thousand people. And of course, those were not anything like the smartphones you have, this bulky, uh, quite basic items. Um, so if a technology can go from 0% adoption to 100% adoption within less than three decades, that's a striking example of very fast-paced adoption. But if you think this is fast, then the um, adoption of some of the fintech innovations that I'm going to talk about is significantly faster. Um, <clears throat> now, when you hear the word uh, fintech, most people think about blockchain and cryptocurrencies, which we'll come to, but uh, fintech is not really a new concept. Even ATM machines uh, at their time were fintech innovations in the 1960s, or debit cards and credit cards. But what has made fintech go um, so en masse is, is just the pace of innovation in this space. Uh, the, the rate of innovation and the abundance of new technologies which have sprung up everywhere. Now, uh, what, is, what is blockchain? Uh, without going too much into the technology, uh, blockchain, you can think of it as these spreadsheets or ledgers which are distributed around the world on, built on the internet. Um, so as opposed to the old system where you would have just one copy of a central ledger. Now you have thousands of these copies of the same ledger. Uh, and they're all linked together, together and constantly synced together, which makes it cryptographically very, very safe. And on, on this infrastructure, you can build anything. You can build uh, digital currencies like cryptos. You can build contracts and uh, pretty much anything that's worth uh, making a record of. For example, in the future, it would be very uh, likely that when you, when you purchase property, that record might, might just be implemented on the blockchain, and people are working towards that. Uh, so it wouldn't be an exaggeration to call the fintech phenomenon a fintech disruption. In fact, I believe it's the prototypical uh, example of a disruption. It has already touched uh, your lives in so many different ways. 
Uh, think about mobile banking that you can do on your phones uh, anywhere in the world at any, at any given time. Uh, think about new forms of insurance that you can purchase uh, and customize, again, uh, through new innovative platforms. Think about the world of personal finance. Uh, well, in the old days, you would have gone to a financial advisor to get advice. Now you ha also have the option of getting advice from algorithms and softwares, otherwise known as robo-advisors. And uh, quite, a, quite a range of other areas. Uh, let's think about payments, lending, capital markets. Uh, all of these um, sub-areas of the fintech landscape are being touched um, and influenced by, by the fintech innovations. So these are some of the uh, um, companies which are currently very active in the world of uh, payments and money transfer. And while they use different technologies, perhaps the common denominator is that they're all very young companies. They've all, they've all been established within the past decade or two. Uh, and that's, that's, the, that's the disruption. So they're all grabbing market share. Um, uh, and that's fascinating, of course. Now, so it's, it wouldn't be, again, an exaggeration to think of it as a tsunami or a large wave. And if you, if you don't know how to ride a wave, well, better learn to swim, right? Um, here's an, here's a, in, an important figure. In 2018, last year, the um, size of the global investments in, in the fintech space was $40 billion. And that number keeps growing. Some people argue that uh, 40 billion is actually a conservative estimate. Uh, the actual number is probably significantly higher, depending on what you would consider fintech. Um, there's another number 40, which is also interesting, and that's the number of unicorns which are fintech related globally. So what is a unicorn? So a unicorn is a private company which is worth at least $1 billion. So with that level of market valuation. Uh, there are 40 of them around. In fact, more than 40 of them around, slightly more. So that's pretty interesting. And a lot of this is happening uh, in different hubs around the world. In Wales, where we are right now, uh, um, plenty of interesting activity in the fintech space is already happening. And a newly formed body called Fintech Wales has uh, has uh, come into shape in order to coordinate this effort. But let's pause for a minute and think about how we got here in the first place. So I want to invite your attention to think about three snapshots in time. Um, in 1999, just before the burst of the dot-com bubble, these companies were the four largest companies in the world in terms of market valuation. So that's how the stock markets would value them. Um, and you can see I've put three of them as logos and one as not a logo. Uh, so the ones that are in logos are the tech companies, right? But of course the dot-com bubble burst and then, uh, and then the situation changed. Fast forward 10 years and you have a slightly different picture. Uh, so the four largest companies were some energy companies. Uh, you still have Microsoft there but you also have a finance company, ICBC, the Chinese bank. Now fast forward another 10 years to the latest data we have, and care to guess what the four largest companies today are? Well, they're all tech, right? Uh, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google. So big tech has re-emerged. Um, if you think this is just the top four, let me, let me show you what the top 10 look like. So these are the same four companies. Now look at the rest of them. These are the 10 largest companies in terms of market valuation right now as we speak. The ones in red are tech companies. The ones in blue are finance companies, right? So what happened? It seems that big tech has re-emerged and What's really interesting is that big tech is getting into finance. Um, now, traditionally, big tech companies were reluctant about getting into finance, uh, especially after the 2008 crash. 
because the financial services sector was heavily regulated, they were not very keen to get into that. But um, more recently, the tech sector is also being regulated, is being watched closely by the governments, as you can see with, for example, Facebook. So, so the tech companies are thinking, well, we are already being regulated, or we are going to be regulated, so let's diversify our incomes and get into finance as well. So th this battle between the red and the blue, the big tech and the big finance, I think is going to be a very, very interesting um, uh, phenomenon to watch in the next few years. Which one is going to dominate? Um, now, as exciting as all this progress is, we, we should also be uh, cautious about the level of overexcitement and the hype that is also in this market and in this sector. And this is important because the hype can cast a shadow on the actual real progress on the legitimate use cases and applications of these technologies. But how would you measure the hype? Um, it's difficult, so you need to have some suggestions and indications. I'm going to invite your attention to a number of examples of the hype in the fintech space. Um, these are some cryptocurrencies which have been heavily backed or promoted by celebrities. And unfortunately, in this case, all three of them, and more broadly, many, many others like these, have been involved with fraud and wrongdoing, and uh, financial regulators have basically issued cease and desist orders against them, um, which just shows um, in, one, in one way how, how hot this market is and how overhyped and overexcited this market is. And of course, the celebrities are not helping in this sense. Um, this has become such a problem that the United States regulator, the SEC, um, did something clever. Um, they wanted to educate investors, so they created a fake web page um, and a fake ICO initial coin offering, and they included uh, pictures of fake celebrities with endorsements of this so-called cryptocurrency called Howie's coin, and, uh, and they also put some science into it. They included a white paper. So many people clicked on the link, actually, uh, and uh, showed interest, and then they were forwarded to the real regulatory web page, which basically cautioned them against this. So here's another example. Um, you may have heard of this. A company called Long Island Ice Tea Company, which produces iced tea mostly in America, um, just before the end of 2017, changed its name to guess what? Long Blockchain Corporation. And just because of that corporate name change, uh, their share price went up 430% in, in a day, in fact, in a few hours. Now, that's, uh, there's, there's no rational way to explain this apart from just the overexcitement of the market. In fact, this company, um, they very transparently said, we are thinking about using the blockchain technology. So there was no fundamental change in their, in, in their, mod in their business model. It was just an declaration or an announcement, but that announcement was sufficient to excite the markets to this extent. And this is not just happening in the United States, unfortunately. Uh, it's happening around the world. For example, in the UK, uh, a company called Online PLC changed its name to uh, Online Blockchain, and then the share price went up 400%. Um, in China, um, a company called Sky People Fruit Juice changed its name to Future FinTech and then the share price went up 200%. So these cosmetic name changes uh, that lead to such exaggerated market reactions can only be an indication of the hype and the emotions in the market. And remember, they're not really, these companies were not really um, changing their business models in any fundamental way. They were just announcing that they might get into it. Um, now, new studies show that these are not exceptions. Unfortunately, this is a pattern. Um, uh, speculative mentions of the word blockchain in financial disclosures has been shown to lead to similar market reactions. Um, now, uh, Shakespeare famously wrote, um, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. 
So it doesn't matter what you call a rose, it is still beautiful, it is still very sweet smelling. But in the world of finance, it matters what you name companies. And uh, in, a, in a famous study, which was called a rose.com by any other name, some researchers found that during the dot-com bubble, those companies that simply added dot-com to their names, again, experienced the market value overvaluation by about 75%. And this was just about association. Again, they were not changing anything fundamentally. They were just adding dot-com to their names. But the story goes beyond that. So um, as, you, as you may know, this is the famous Bitcoin price chart um, uh, in 2000, at the beginning of 2018 or end of 2017. It reached um, a price of about $20,000 and then it crashed. Now there's every compelling reason to think that this was a classic speculative bubble. If you go back sufficiently long in history, you have seen examples of this before. We have seen examples of this before and there's a body of academic studies about this. For example, uh, in the 17th century, uh, tulips, exotic rare tulips were so overvalued in the Netherlands that you could basically uh, buy houses in the center of Amsterdam by exchanging a few tulips. Um, now, of course, we're not suggesting that bitcoins are like tulips, but the underlying excitement and psychological emotions that, that um, form this speculation are very similar. And if you, um, if you read um, the insights of uh, psychologists, um, uh, basically the idea is that in, in these sorts of speculative bubbles, what happens initially is a bit of excitement about a new innovation, which then leads to euphoric levels of excitement, but then ev inevitably panic sets in and then they crash. And what's, what's very interesting is that these emotions, many of them are unconscious emotions. People like Freud have talked about this. Um, so that's why it's very difficult to learn from experience because these emotions are not conscious emotions, they're actually quite unconscious emotions. So all technological innovations can can lead to overexcitement. With financial innovations, that danger is even more so because there is the promise of abundant wealth. And that's what we need to be careful about. So I want to conclude by reminding you that um, there have been many examples of innovations in history which have not survived the test of time. Um, Snow screens for the face, a family bicycle, or a single wheel motorcycle are just three of those examples. It's, it's extremely important to remain optimistic and excited about the future that FinTech promises us, but also just not get overexcited. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Armand, for what was a very well-balanced uh, and sensible talk about fintech. Now, Wales is hot on the fintech trail at the moment. It's not surprising given we've got quite a recent history of building global insurance brands, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about that from Confuse.com CEO later on. I'm sure you're all very excited about that. Now, let me welcome our next speaker. Our next speaker is a final year medical student who is interested in public health and is involved with the International Federation of Medical Students. That's the IFMSA for short, if you can remember that. And also the Students for Global, Global Health UK. Exploring how small actions can lead to big changes. Please welcome, are you ready? Excellent, Lopa Banerjee. Hi everyone and thank you all for coming as well as the people online. Just to start my talk, I'd like to start off with a quick experiment. So, I'm going to clap. And now, after three, I want everyone in this room to clap on three. So one, two, three. And that is the difference between one person doing something and 250 people doing something. So when I say the words, 
public health, what sort of springs to mind? Is it people in Ebola suits? Is it mountains of paperwork? Maybe it's vaccines. Or potentially, someone just nagging at you to eat some vegetables and do some exercise. Now, public health can be quite a complex topic to sort of get your head around. But I'm hoping that over the next few minutes, I can give you all a brief overview to what it is, why it's important, and what we can do to help. So a commonly asked question at a lot of medical school interviews is, why do you want to do medicine? Which is sort of fair enough. And there's a lot of answers to this question, including a love of science, wanting to work with people, thinking you'll look good in scrubs. But I think a lot of people go into it because they want to help people, which was my reason as well. And as I did my training, and as I went through the years, and I still got many more ahead of me, I realized that modern medicine can only help people so far. Take Mrs. Jones as an example, who has been unfortunate enough to have a heart attack. Yes, we can treat that heart attack with aspirin and stents, but why did she have that heart attack in the first place? How can we stop another one from happening? How can we stop it from happening to someone else? And how do we know that the treatment we are giving her is the most optimum treatment? To me, public health is all of those things. It is health and medicine at a population level, as well as at an individual level. And it is evidence-based, and it's all about protection rather than just the cure. Now, the WHO, or the World Health Organization, defines it as all organized measures to prevent disease, promote health, and prolong life amongst the population as a whole. So where does global health fit into all of this? Now, there's a new definition that seems to come out every year, a new journal article, and even one from The Lancet that said global health is public health. So with all this confusion, what actually is, public, uh, is global health? And there's a few underlying concepts that keep reoccurring. The first of which is that it's population health on a global level. It's all about global cooperation. It's not just about rich countries helping poor countries. It's a lot more complex than that. And some of the principles from public health also ring true for global health as well, including that evidence-based approach and the fact it's multidisciplinary. Doctors and healthcare professionals alone aren't going to be the ones to solve all our public health challenges. And finally, the concept of health equity, which moves me nicely on to the difference between equality and equity. And this is quite a famous cartoon you might have seen before. And it's the idea that with equality, everyone is treated the same. But with equity, everyone is given the same chance at success, as you can see from these boxes and how they've been rearranged so that everyone, depending on their needs, can see the baseball game, which is not quite rugby, but it's good enough. I think the other thing that bamboozles a lot of people is how broad a topic it is because you've got infectious diseases like Ebola, malaria, HIV, you've got non-communicable diseases like heart disease and diabetes, you've got maternal and reproductive and child health, and you've got politics thrown into the milieu as well in terms of what's the most ideal healthcare system, migrant health, and also access to medicines and fair pricing for treatment. And we also have the environment, which might not seem that directly relevant to human health, but The Lancet believes that climate change is the biggest threat to global health and human health over the 21st century because of its effects on agriculture, access to safe water, conflict, and with tropical climates, we get more tropical disease and potentially new disease as well. Now, all of this can seem like a lot to unpack, but I'm here to say there are three key parts to public health. Prevention, promote, uh, protection, and promotion. So starting with prevention, it's essentially specific evidence-based population and individual interventions for sort of minimizing disease as well as risk factors. And I say evidence-based because these ideas haven't been just plucked from the ether. They have been rigorously tested in thousands, if not millions of people over the years. And certain examples include screening for certain cancers, supplements, for example, for pregnant women, and vaccines, which can help at not just an individual, but at a population level. At an individual level, when you give someone a vaccine, you're protecting them against a horrible disease such as measles or polio. And at a population level, you get something called herd immunity. So in that top diagram, you have an unvaccinated population. 
so the disease can spread willy-nilly to the most vulnerable in society, depicted in red, who will suffer the worst consequences of the disease. In the bottom panel, we have a vaccinated population. And as you can see, the people in green are vaccinated, so the disease can't spread to them, and therefore the disease can't then spread to the people that are vulnerable in yellow. Vaccines have also seen a modern-day success story because in 1980, the WHO declared that smallpox, a terrible, terrible disease, had been eradicated, and that was through immunization. The second concept I'd like to talk about is health protection, which is about protecting individuals and populations, again, against infectious diseases. So that's where swine flu and Ebola comes in. And it also encompasses antimicrobial resistance, which is where we've now got these superbugs that our normal antibiotics can no longer treat. It also includes incidents and environmental hazards such as chemical leaks as well as climate change, which we discussed earlier. And finally, we have health promotion, which is about empowering people to take control of their health behaviors and lead healthier lifestyles. Now, some of the more eagle-eyed among you might notice that that is Caerphilly Castle. And I didn't just include that because I like Caerphilly Castle. It's because a revolutionary, groundbreaking study happened there called the Caerphilly Cohort Study. And the data from that study has go gone on to inform over 400 separate pieces of research, including the research that showed us that low-dose daily aspirin can help prevent heart attacks in certain people. That research also showed us that there are five key health behaviors that really impact our health, from whether we get cognitive decline and dementia later in life, to rates of diabetes, vascular disease, and cancer. And they found that by changing four out of five of these behavior, behaviors in the Caerphilly cohort study, it reduced the incidence of these diseases by the rates you can see on the slides. Health promotion also includes substance misuse, mental health, sexual health, and also domestic violence. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Some of the ways that we use to empower people include education, awareness, and policies. And this explains why you might have seen adverts like these on the TV from the NHS. You might see things like this in your GP surgeries. And it explains why the government is trying to implement policies like this, such as the sugar tax, because they think that it might help us all improve our health behaviors. And now we move on to the slightly scarier part of the presentation. How much do you think having access to good medical care impacts whether you get sick, or if you do get sick, whether or not you get better. Because the answer might surprise you. It's only 10 to 20%. The other 80 to 90% of what determines whether you get sick, and if you do get sick, whether you get better, is the social determinants of health. There's a very eminent researcher called Sir Professor Michael Marmot who sort of came up with this concept and has researched it extensively. And he calls it the causes of the causes. But what does that mean? Going back to our example with Mrs. Jones and her heart attack, she, why did she have that heart attack? At the end of the day, she had it because her arteries were clogged up and oxygen couldn't reach her heart because of that. And it might have been due to lifestyle factors, which we discussed on a previous slide with her health behaviors. So, for example, she might have had a 1,000 Welsh cakes every single day for the last 20 years. She might have smoked 80 cigarettes every single day. She might have never have exercised. And she might have been, quote, unquote, afraid of fruit. I've heard that being said before. But the thing is, is that it's all very well saying that. But then why does she have that lifestyle in the first place? And that is what is meant by the causes of the causes. She might have wanted to have exercised but didn't have enough money for a gym membership. She might have wanted to have changed her diet, but didn't know how to, or didn't have the time because of a stressful job and a stressful lifestyle. And she might have wanted to have stopped smoking, but didn't have adequate access to smoking cessation support. And that is what the WHO means by the social determinants. They're the conditions by which people and we are born, we grow, we work, and we age. And it is dictated by money, power, resources, and how they're distributed on a local, national, and global level. Long story short, it is the uncomfortable and sad link between health and wealth. And there have been countless studies that have shown that inequality in the way that we live, the way that we work, and the way that we were raised can lead to inequalities in our mental and our physical health. And nowhere is this more stark than when you look at life expectancies. 
So as you can see from the graph, life expectancies have almost doubled since the 1800s to now. But this benefit has not been shared by everyone in society equally. The lowest socioeconomic groups in this country can expect to live on average seven years less than those in the highest socioeconomic groups. And to me, that is so sad, so unjust, and just completely unacceptable. Health should be beyond politics and should not be so linked to wealth in this day and age. And over my time at university, I've been very lucky to have been part of an organization called Students for Global Health, which is a network of all the global health societies from across the UK. And we have a vision in which equity in health is a reality for all. And we hope to achieve this through education, advocacy, and action. And we're actually part of an even bigger international organization called the International Federation of Medical Students Association, which is a collection of one million medical students from around the world, from 123 different countries. And their motto is to act local or think global. But it works the other way around as well, you see. So think global, act local. And that is what sort of inspired this talk. Now, they're not the first, and they won't be the last to use this motto, because it's been used by Scottish city planners, it's been used by businesses like McDonald's, and now recently, more in global health, and successfully so, as you can see from these journal articles. The other thing these organizations have taught me is that as individuals, as students, as a university, we have so much more power than we think we do. Whether it's through student-run organizations, sort of healthy lifestyle and fundraising for charity sort of events like the Cardiff Half Marathon, or world-leading research that's happening in the buildings around us even today, we have more power than we think to disrupt the ordinary and make a change. And never has disrupting the ordinary been more important. We are living through a volatile political climate, a climate emergency, and the gap between the rich and poor is only deepening. And as this graph shows, the richest 1% of the world's population has the same amount of money and wealth as the 99%, which is just bonkers, if you ask me. But there is hope. Through incremental changes, either done over time, over days, weeks, months, years, or by ma many, many individuals, so individual action, but on a mass scale, so done by 100 people, 1,000 people, even a million people, we can make a difference, whether it's through vaccinating our communities to achieve herd immunity and eradicate disease, introducing more recycling options at our workplace or in our communities, or just being a little bit more frugal and thinking about how we approach antibiotics. We can disrupt the ordinary. We can make changes. And it would be very naive of me to say that individual action alone is the panacea to ending all our public health challenges, because policies such as Fair Society Healthy Lives by the Marmot Review and government-level decisions will also play a huge, huge part. But individual action is a huge part of the puzzle and should never be underestimated. And as humans, we've overcome huge challenges in the past, and we can do it again, whether it's through eradicating diseases such as smallpox, civil rights movements throughout history, and now starting to address our climate emergency. As you can see, the UK's greenhouse gas emissions are starting to fall, and we have the emergence of new leaders such as Greta, and I'm so excited to see what might happen over the next few decades. For every cigarette not smoked, your body starts to recover. For every person that decides to eat a little less meat, the food industry responds by producing more vegetarian options, making more vegan options available. And that has a knock-on effect, making more people consider going meat-free. And for every child vaccinated, we get one step closer to eradicating another disease. And I leave you with the paraphrase words of Anne-Marie Bono, AKA the Zero Waste Chef. It's not about one or two people doing everything perfectly. It's about lots of people doing things imperfectly. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> um, so first of all, public health, what a timely topic for what's happening at the moment. That's really, really cool. Um, I have to point at the funny images that we used in this. I thought they were brilliant. I don't know about you guys, but I thought they were hilarious. Um, and the other thing as well I wanted to actually touch on, um, Elon Musk is quite popular for breaking things down into the fundamental components and then using those to sort of build things again from scratch, like how he did with the rockets, for example, from NASA. 
And it's really cool to learn today that one of the fundamental things that we need to look at for the public health problem is the social element. It's something I personally hadn't considered before, and after this talk I have now. So um, yeah, a massive thank you for that. Uh, and I think it'd be very, very interesting to sort of use that to build on it and to make things better. Our fourth speaker for tonight is an impact specialist within the School of Engineering, helping academics with engagement and impact. She has been a woman in STEM ever since she decided to study science at an um, A-levels. And she's going to discuss why the words we use in relation to women in STEM are powerful things and why it might be time to change. Please, everybody, welcome Helen O.B. Redden. Thank you very much, everybody. My name is Helen, and I am a leak. But more on leaks later. I'm talking to you today about women in STEM. It's a big, complex problem, and we've been talking about it for over 100 years, and we don't really seem to be getting anywhere. Women in STEM is just a shorthand for how we encourage girls and women to uh, study and then work in the science, technology, engineering, and maths subjects. But the thing is, if we keep doing the same old thing in the same old ways, we're only ever going to get the same old results, which is not enough women in STEM. So I'm going to disrupt some of the words and some of the stories I hear regularly and see if we can come up with something a little bit different. Our words have power. They can lift us up and they can break us down. They can hurt and they can heal. They can make us feel part of a community or make us feel completely excluded. We've only got to look at the state of our media, social media, and politics to see all that happening. But words are amazing things because they're a power that each and every one of us can have. We can choose what words we use or not. We can choose if we communicate or not. We can choose whether or not we listen. And with enough people using enough words, they start to build into stories. And stories are truly amazing because they can change the world. Now, my background is in public engagement and science communication. I'm not going to bore you with a load of theory. I am going to introduce you to a tiny part of it, and that's my model. I'm so proud I built this. This is how I think about my stories and my projects. But we're only going to use half of it today. So the audience is the group of people that you want to work with, who you want to get your stories to. The purpose is the reason behind the project or the story. And the assumptions are anything that you may have assumed about the audience, the story, or the project. So I'm going to use this to look at some of the key stories. But please remember, I never have a problem with the storytellers, only the stories. It's not the people, it's the words. On to our first story. How do we get more women in STEM? I hear this a lot. The last time I heard it, I was sat in this big glitzy women in STEM launch event. It's really rather nice. And one thing that struck me is if you want to get girls into STEM, they're not even in the room. We need to ask them. And the audience that they had in that room were people like me. It's been a long time since I've been in school. And yes, you can ask your audience, but you can also ask them by proxy if you need to. So you could talk to teachers, but they're busy people, and they can only give you part of the picture because they don't have the lived experience. So an assumption that's been made here is that the people in front of you are the people that need to hear that story. And that's not always the case. So my key point on this one is go and ask your audience, because usually they really appreciate that someone's thought to do that. Schools should be doing this. I heard this at exactly the same event, and I had to stand up in that workshop and said, actually, I don't think it's just to do with schools. And I had a load of teachers in the background silently cheering me on. We know that schools have got a massive part to play in this. We know that aspirations are set early. We know that the ethos of the school and how they teach is really, really important to the genders and how they deal with gender awareness and gender bias. But we've made two critical assumptions here. One assumption is that we only learn in school, and we know that's not true. We never stop learning. The other is that girls will spend the majority of their time in school. And I calculated it out. And of all the hours in the year, you only spend about an eighth in school. The rest of the time, they're somewhere else. So where are those somewhere else's? They could be any number of community organizations. Think of the power of working with brownies or rainbows or guides to, to get, help them get their badges in STEM. That could be the first time that that girl has been recognized in STEM. That's a powerful story. What about 
the opportunity to link up between St. John and the life sciences. There could be a massive, massive opportunity there. Welcome have recognised the importance of youth organisations as well, because they can support and reach young people, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, that schools simply can't do. And that's no disrespect for the schools, because they're different organisations working in different areas, and that's OK. I spent about 15 years working with schools, doing STEM projects. And by the time I came to the end of it, I came to realise I could do the best project in the world. But my story is probably not going to be the reason why that girl chooses to go into STEM. And there's one reason for this. I'm not one of their key influencers. I'm only part of the story. Key influencers are people like teachers, family members, friends, people in the community who have whose stories have real power and words have real meaning to those girls. I was in one school in Cardiff and I heard a teacher say to a group of girls, oh, you can go and be care workers. Now, I do not have a problem with care workers. We need them as much as we need women in STEM. What I have a problem with is he never said it to the boys. And if you can go and be a care worker, you can go into the caring professions. Why can't you be a doctor, a nurse, a surgeon, a vet? So instead of expanding those horizons, he's just taken them down to a pinpoint because he's likely to be one of their key influencers. The IET have been doing work on this, and this report was published 10 years ago. And still, in our stories, we're not getting the roles of the key influencers coming through. We'll ask the parents to come into school. Another one you hear on a regular basis. Well, you can, and all schools are different, but if that parent hasn't had a good experience of school as a child, then school's a really scary place. And there are other issues as well. It can't, sometimes it's not easy for those parents to get there. Maybe they work full time, maybe they've got caring responsibilities. Perhaps the child themselves doesn't want that parent to go in because the child doesn't want to be seen to be different. So by the time you start adding together lots of different barriers, you can't even see the school, let alone engage with it. So how are you going to get to the audience of parents? And I can't answer that, I'm afraid, because it's going to be different for every school and every community. One size will not fit all. The assumption as well is that this is the right way to, to engage with parents, and it's not. You've really got to think about where it's going to matter for them. We have a problem with women in STEM. Come and join us. Well, this is a strange story. I think maybe we've got two mixed together here. Because if I was receiving that story, I would be thinking, why do you want me to be part of a problem? It's like that really weird thing when someone takes a bite to eat and goes, oh, this tastes terrible. Try this. Why do I want to try that? You've just told me it's awful. When an organization sent up, so what we've got to look here is about the, the story. Is this the right story for the audience? What purpose are you trying to get over with this story? What assumptions have you really made behind it? Is this a, a story that works? So when an organization sends out a story to an audience, something happens in the middle, interference. We call it noise. And noise can come from any number of places. Family, friends, parents, schools, media, all over the place. And by the time this noise takes place, the story changes. So some of it kind of shoots off at a weird angle, and we don't know where it goes. Some of it loops back to the organization in a really weird way. Some goes round and round in circles, and goodness only knows what happened to that. So only part of the story ever gets through. So we've got to work on our stories, make sure more of it gets through, and make sure it's the right story. We can run a girls only event. There's a big construction company working in Cardiff on lots of different projects. And they came to me and said, can we talk about doing some women in STEM stuff? Yes, of course, no problem. So I sat down with their representative, and the first thing they said to me was, we can do a girls only event. And I felt a bit sorry for him, because I had to burst his bubble a bit at that point. Because what you've got to think about here is the purpose. You've got to ask yourself a lot of questions. What am I truly putting across about this sector in STEM? I've never worked in teams that are one gender or the other. Is this the right way to go? And ultimately, is this truly going to support the girls that you want to work with? Because if it's not, don't do it. And I'm not saying don't do girls-only events. What I'm saying is do it when it's really the right thing for your audience, but never make it the default position. If you don't become a researcher, you're a leak in the pipeline. Remember the leaks thing from earlier? This is it. 
And this is how this statement makes me feel. Because I am not a researcher. And I know lots of other women that feel this way too. So let me introduce you to the STEM pipeline first. This is the idea that we have a lot of girls studying STEM at GCSE level, fewer at A level, fewer at undergrad, fewer at postgrad, right the way through the academic levels. And if you don't make it to that next academic level, you're considered to be a leak to the system. Now, remembering I never have a problem with the storytellers, only the stories, very helpfully here, they've even included a drain. So not only do we leak out, I can only assume that we're headed towards the sewage treatment works of life choices. Something's going wrong here with this story because you've alienated half of your audience at least. That's not a good thing for a story. Why are we telling a pipeline story? Does that really reflect what happens? And what other assumptions have we made here as well? The critical assumption is STEM is the same as research. It is not. Are you seriously telling me that all of these careers and other things that I haven't had space to put on here don't benefit from having women in STEM working in them? The Aspires report recognizes this as well. Massive piece of research. If we can't tell stories about the doors that open when you have a STEM background, then fewer girls want to go into it in the first place. To the best of my knowledge, my STEM background has only ever opened doors. It's never closed them. But something else that's a bit wrong is this whole idea that our lives are linear anyway. It doesn't work like that. I describe my career as a series of accidents. So I started off working in something not that much to do in my first degree, and then someone gave me another opportunity, and I changed direction, and something else came up, and I changed direction again. A pipeline really doesn't work anymore. It's more of a network. But my challenge to any organization that wants to recruit and retain women in STEM is are you truly ready for us? If you don't have the environment to attract women in STEM in the first place and then to keep them, you're only ever part of the problem, not the solution. 50% of the apprenticeships started, were started by women and only 8% completed. This indicates to me that we've got serious systemic problems somewhere. A friend of mine, her niece, got an apprenticeship. Niece is chuffed to bits. It's precisely the area of engineering she wants to go into. Except, she turns up on the first day. There's no changing rooms for women, and there's no protective equipment in her size. Everything's too big. And if those two things that can be foreseen can't be sorted out before she got there, then what are we going to do about the more big and complex problems? So what's the solution? I'm really sorry, but I don't think there is one solution. And the reason for that is we're actually dealing with a load of individuals. Even though we talk about women in STEM, they're all different. So a story that works for one group is not going to work for another. And that's OK, because it's OK to tailor your stories. And this is big and complicated as well. I haven't even touched on intersectionality or the experience of trans women or STEM, if you want to go even bigger. What about the place that boys and men from deprived backgrounds have in STEM? Because they've got one too if they want it. But the really important thing is that each and every one of us has got a role to play in this. So politicians, get your own houses in order and give us some role models and some good ones at that. Policy makers, give us policy that matters. Equality in pay was enshrined in law before I was born and we're not there yet. Press and the media, what stories are you telling? What stereotypes are you reinforcing? Universities and research funders, short-term contracts with long working hours aren't helping anybody. And finally, my challenge to each and every one of you, to use your power of words. So when you see anything in the media or social media, in our communities or in our societies, where the story isn't right, where you see the stereotype, where you see the bias, Take your power of words and use them. Because with a lot of us using our words, they build into stories. And maybe, just maybe, we can change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. What a fantastic first half 
of the event. Let's just reflect a little bit on what we've learned so far. So lawyers work for free, even uh, those where they come from families where strong earnings is the motivation. Um, on a more serious point, I think it's a really fitting topic to talk about the day after the First Minister gives an update to the Assembly on the Justice in Wales project, something worth looking at. We need banking, but we might not need banks. Wales is looking for its first unicorn, but we shouldn't get caught up in the hype. Quite often the opportunities are out there, but it's a case of timing sometimes. We've had an introduction to public health, and I think we now understand that we have to think beyond our immediate environment, think about how our actions can have a butterfly effect. Um, think globally, but act locally was the message. It's really nice. Words are powerful and we have power over words. This resonates with me as a, as a woman in STEM. I was going to introduce myself as a former woman in STEM, but Helen has now convinced me that I am still part of that STEM network proudly. And I think if I relate some of Helen's messages back to recruitment, for example, the, when we use positive and inclusive language in a recruitment advert, we are much more likely to get a diverse range of applicants. And diversity leads to increased productivity and innovation, so why wouldn't we do that? So really what I think that certainly I've taken away from this, and I hope you have as well, is that firstly I'm very inspired and I'm empowered by what I've heard, but I've realized that we can have a much bigger impact on the world than we first think. We can influence movements through our passion, our behaviors, and even our words, and that's really special. Absolutely, completely agree. Um, we now have a half an hour refreshments break. Uh, please do head to the lodge to check out our interactive exhibits. And remember to take your snack voucher from your gift bag, or I will take it and eat everything myself. Um, and yeah, during the break, we will welcome Cardiff University's a cappella society. He will perform two special performances for us. We'll see you guys after the break.
experience of helping companies make strategies work, overcoming huge, cha huge challenges and transforming how they operate. Sounds like a lot of fun. Exploring how disruption is not for zany entrepreneurs and mavericks only, please welcome um, Serge Barmy. Thanks. Hello. Can anyone hear me? It's good. OK. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the break. I, I consider this a bit of a break as well, a break from the really clever stuff, because there's been some fantastic talks. There's fantastic talks coming after me. Um, but this is a bit of a dip, I'll be honest. Uh, first of all, I have no slides. So if anyone wants to take any photos, all you're going to get is an old Asian guy, bald, on a red map. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, and secondly, I'm going to tell you stuff that you kind of already know. Um, so anyone wants to leave that, you can. Uh, but maybe in a different way. So um, me, so I'm not clever enough to invent anything, do any big disruptive thing that's new. Um, I kind of flip between stuff. So the, the, the subjects I took at school, what I did at university, I have no real plan to it. Uh, still doesn't. Um, I fell into jobs, fell into careers, fell into industries. And I fell into um, management consulting. That industry where, where big corporations call you to solve what they perceive, and that's an important word, the most pressing problems, strategic, technical, operational, people, structural, all of those things. Um, so I flitted with that for a while. And I'm not even clever enough to specialize. So I ended up collecting sectors, financial services, insurance, banking, wealth, national intelligence, always an interesting one, uh, manufacturing, engineering, local government, central government, all sorts of things. Um, but the thing with me is, in consulting, I had a healthy dislike for authority and being told what to do. Some would say unhealthy. I also had a dislike of jargon, of waffle, of producing really nice reports that actually didn't tell you anything. Um, and then saying, well, why don't I just do this on my own? So I did. And I started falling into sectors and falling into things like I always do. Um, and I started noticing patterns and changing things and thinking, right, if I change this, we could do this, we do this. And then people started coming up to me and going, you've really disrupted us. And I thought, well, I haven't really. Um, so no, it's been disruptive. We've got all these different results. I thought, well, I haven't done anything kind of new. Because this word disruption just kept coming up again and again and again. In people that I spoke to, in colleagues I worked with, more than one, one occasion, I'd had someone come up to me by the side of me and say, Serge, can I disrupt you a minute? I said, no, you're only interrupting me. You're not really disrupting me. No, but I'm going to disrupt the way you think. No, I'll carry on thinking. I may have a new thought. That's fine. More than once, I've been introduced to people. When I ask them what they do, they say, I'm a chaos monkey, or I'm a chaos junkie. OK, what does that mean? Oh, I go in and try and disrupt things in our company. I do things differently. OK. I thought that was a fad until it hit me. Chief disruption officer. That's a role. I thought, no, it can't be, until I did some research. Two and a half thousand largest companies in the world, 20% of them have filled the role of chief disruption officer. Innovation isn't enough anymore. Change isn't enough anymore. We need disruption. And you need to be the CDO. I thought, maybe it's just work. But no, 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 no. Even on a social basis, I'm sat with a bunch of people talking about stuff after work. It was around the time when we were having um, quite a few security threats. And the government were holding COBRA meetings. And we talked about COBRA meetings. Having been one of the sectors I'd collected and worked in, I kind of said, well, you know what COBRA stands for, don't you? Some did, some didn't. Um, they said, no. Well, it sounds really sinister and like, oh, there's a threat. Let's have a COBRA meeting. It actually stands for Cabinet Office Briefing Room A. The place where they hold COBRA meetings is called Cabinet Office Briefing Room A. Nothing sinister, nothing big. The reason I tell you this is some people that I was talking to knew, some people didn't. Of one of the ones that didn't, they suddenly piped up and said, wow, Serge, you've just dropped a knowledge bomb. But wow, have I, have I blown up some mythical intellectual landscape here? I, all I did was explain an acronym. But you see people, the language, it's all got to be new, disruptive, explosive, even knowledge bombs, when I'm just explaining a little fact and an acronym. 
And it kind of got me wondering. I thought, well, where, where does it kind of end? So you go to Google and you type in disrupting the ordinary. Depending on how the algorithm is working at that one time, you'll get anything between four and a half to five and a half million results. That's a lot of disrupting the ordinary. It's a lot of people doing disruption. And you think, well, who's doing all this? So you look and you find that there's 660,000 new businesses being registered every year in the UK. 70 an hour. Take every man, woman, child in Glasgow and ask them to start a business every year. That's what we're looking at. And a lot of these businesses will have disruptive ideas which will absolutely make things better for the world, for people, for users. And a lot of them will fail. And they'll fail because they don't do the boring stuff well. You may have a really good idea, but you need cash flow. You need to communicate. You need to plan. You need to look at how you're performing. You need to look at performance management. You need to look at all those things. You have to present. You have to communicate. You have to do things that actually don't seem very exciting. In fact, um, you also have to learn to negotiate. And one of the most disruptive skills, I guess, in any sort of negotiation is Silence. One of the greatest tools that you can use. Now, I know what you're thinking. Thinking, has he forgotten he has no slides? There's nothing to look at. Has he frozen? What's going on? But no, actually saying something and just being quiet is a really good thing. Um, people forget that, especially in today's connected world, which is great to be connected, but everyone needs to fill a silence. I mean, you can think back now to that silence there, which is probably maybe 12, 13 seconds, maybe felt like a few minutes. The feelings in yourself, thinking, oh my god, what's going on? Is he asking a question? Do I have to answer something? Those are exactly the people feelings feel. That, that's not exactly the feelings that people feel when they're faced with silence. On more than one occasion, I've had someone come into my office and say, Serge, we've got this really big problem. Thing is, if we go down this route, it's going to really affect this whole business unit. And I say, hmm. And then they say, but if we took that part of the business unit and it into this plan, we could probably get away with it. And you go, hmm. And they say, yeah, I'll go do that. Serge, thanks a lot. You've been a great help. Anytime anyone wants me to help them by saying absolutely nothing, and they talk themselves into a solution, I'm the guy. Honestly, I'm the guy. Because that, that is silence. And that's not a new thing, but it does disrupt. It's just one of the simple tools I think people forget. So back to me. As I said, I'm not clever enough to invent anything. Although I think I was clever enough to know that I wasn't clever enough, if you get what I mean. Um, and then I thought, well, the stuff I'm doing and the stuff I've done over companies and sectors, and they've all said, oh, we've got disruptive results, and I don't think that way. What does that mean? How, what do I do then? Am I really inventing something or not? Um, I looked around, and way back in 1883, there was a guy called George Pentecost. Now, George Pentecost was a religious writer, and he wrote an essay. And the essay was about a sculptor he met when he was a boy. And the sculptor had a large block of marble. And as a boy, he said to him, what are you going to make out of that? And the sculptor said, I'm not going to make anything. He said, what are you going to turn it into? He said, I'm going to turn it into an angel. He said, well, how are you going to turn it into an angel if you're not going to make anything? He said, I'm going to find the angel. He said, well, how do you do that? He goes, it's easy. I just chip away everything that's not the angel. And it dawned on me, that's kind of what we do, or kind of what my company does. We look at stuff that's already there, we chip away at stuff, and something gets created. And people think you've invented something new, when you haven't. We started going into companies saying, we've got massive strategic problems, what do we do? And we go, right, turn off all your business reporting. Said, what, all of it? Yeah, all of it. Turn it all off. Gone. They turned it all off. A week later, people started going mad. I can't get my data, what's going on? Oh my god. So we looked at the important ones, we turned that back on. Overall, we turned about 15% of the reports back on. 85% of them stayed off. Suddenly, they started looking at a narrow focus of data. They started looking at what does that mean? Oh, our products aren't good enough. Oh, there's other markets we haven't looked at. Our geographical spread, maybe we need to open offices in other areas of the world. 
They did all these things, the results were through the roof, and they come back and say, wow, you've really disrupted us. And I say, well, actually, we just turned off your business reporting. We went in and started halving timescales. Oh, you're going to deliver that by next October. How about if you delivered it by April? Oh, we can't do that. Mm. What could you deliver by April? Uh, well, we can have a look at it. Yeah, that'd be good. How about we cut all your meeting times in half? How about we just note a couple of actions, who's going to do them, and lo and behold, you follow up with the people if they've done them or not. Transformational, I know. But many people don't get this. And you think, well, why don't they get it? Why, don't, why wouldn't you do that? Why, is this disruption? Is it not? I know we've had a couple of um, hand raises here, but I'm not going to do it as a survey. Um, if you could just all put one hand up as high as it would go. Just one hand. Could you put it all up for me, please? That's including the people in the posh seats. That'd be good. OK. On the count of three, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. OK. On the count of three, when I say three, give me a few more inches height on that, OK? One, two, three, go. OK, thank you, thank you. So everyone who raised their hands on the count of three, why? Why would you do that? Did you not hear me? I said, put one hand up as high as it will go. I then said, put it up higher. If you put it up higher, you did not put it up as high as it would go. Now, there's a couple of reasons why you would have done that. One would have been, I'm not playing this silly game. Who do you think he is? Valid. Um, the second would be, you didn't listen. Or the third, which is probably more likely, is you could have, but you didn't. You chose not to. Even subconsciously, you chose not to. And that's what happens in people, in organizations, in companies. They're not stretching as high as they could go. They think they are. And when you find that stretch between where they are and the higher they go, that suddenly gets termed disruption. No, we don't have to build a new arm. We actually just need your own arm to stretch a bit higher. And people start getting disruptive results. And they say they're disruptive. And you think, well, it's not really disruptive. What do you mean? And we've done this time and time and time again. We've used silence. We've cut meeting times in half. We've looked at how people could do more with less. They're all glib phrases, but actually doing it is what counts. And then people come to us and they go, you really have disrupted us. And I say, we haven't really done anything disruptive at all. Or have we? Thank you very much. Thank you, Serge. You reminded me, actually, of a quote that says, silence isn't empty, it's full of answers. And I'll remember to stop referring to myself as a chaos monkey going forward. So, our next speaker is an economics student who has worked in a variety of roles from Tesco to Google, taken inspiration from his learnings from each experience, and has gone on to set up the Tazel Foundation, which is a non-profit charity that identifies, inspires, and educates young people. Discussing how, he, how we can apply a revolutionary mindset to our everyday lives, please welcome Andre Zapatichny. Sorry, I've said that wrong. <laughs> welcome, Andre. Thank you. That was really good. Revolutionary mindset. In October 1917, the Bolsheviks stormed the Winter Palace. What they did was they disposed of the Tsar and then the provisional government after. Years of ruling by the Tsar was gone. A revolutionary changed 200 years of processes due to one idea. Revolutions have happened time and time again. We've seen it in history happening. It's happening in technology, it's happened in governments and in colonies. In 2014, the Ukrainian rose up to corrupt governments. They realized they were gonna put a stand against corruption and fear. What do you believe in? Let me ask you this one question. What do you believe in that will change revolution, that will change you from time and time again? My talk here is to look at what can we look at in revolutions and apply them to our day-to-day -day lives. What made revolutions so special that we're able to take down and bring down governments bring down economies and armies. And if we take a look back and we decode what a revolution is, 
we always see that there was one person who believed in a different way of thinking. That one person had a thought, an idea, and a belief to change and disrupt centuries old of thinking. Thoughts over time become beliefs, and beliefs then become your mindset. So what can we do to change our mindsets and stage a revolution from within? Take a look at the most successful titans of our time, Steve Jobs, Oprah, and Elon Musk. These guys didn't bring down governments, but what they did was revolutionize technology and revolutionize the phones we have in our hands and technology we use today. But these guys were the same as us. They probably even sat in the same chairs when they were our age. But the one thing they had was they had a belief and a vision of something else. They didn't have to go to special schools. They didn't have special friends. They just had a special belief in an idea. So I began to decode what we can do to apply what was so special about these guys and what can we do to apply these revolutionary mindsets into our day-to-day -day lives. And so buckle in, guys, because there's 10 steps. So the first step is to start each day with a task completed. Will Smith said that you don't just build a wall. You take a brick and you lay it perfectly in every brick perfectly. You take each brick and make sure it's the best brick that you've ever placed. And soon enough, you'll build yourself a wall. So what can you do from this principle? Well, everything you do, take an idea or a belief that you want to do. Be that change the world, be that write a research paper, or help someone else. Take a step back and every day work on a micro goal to achieve that goal. Because in a year's time, your impact will be far greater than what you did today. Step two is find someone to help you through life. Realize this, that you can't change the world alone. And you always need that one person to keep you up. If you believe in something, be that anything you want, you'll find people with the same motives and same beliefs and passions as you. And they'll set a bar high. Because some days when you wake up, you'll realize, actually, maybe, why am I doing this? But that one person, because you share the same belief and you same, share the same vision, will put you up to, to a higher level. And a lot of people ask me, Andre, how do you find these people to lift you up? You know, I have friends, we talk about stuff, but what do we do? It's you establish that mindset. You speak to people, and if they're curious enough and passionate about the topic, they'll keep pushing you. The next day, they'll message you, like, let's do it. So these same people in five years' time will help you grow once you've helped them grow too. Step three is respect everyone. Now, people go through all walks of life. People have different opinions, different perspectives, and different cultures. And a lot of us, through our unconscious bias, might categorize people. I do it too. Don't worry about it. But everyone has value. Everyone has an opinion about the way of thinking. So what happens when you respect people? Even if you don't like them, respecting someone is giving them the time of day to listen to their opinion and listen to their value. Step and then know that life isn't fair. There'll be people more successful than you, people having that job you always wanted, or people driving that Porsche or that nicer car. But here's one thing. If you do something you're so passionate and, you're, and you believe in, and you do something that you enjoy doing, you have to realize that success doesn't necessarily mean money. Your success might be your fulfillment in life. It might be the friends you're surrounded with in 10 years' time. You know, what does it mean to have a nicer car or a nicer house? or more salary if you're not fulfilled. So remember, even though life might not be fair because someone's earning more money or in a higher position, if you do something you believe in and you're doing something you enjoy, not banking or you might be doing in scientific research or helping people through charity means, your fulfillment means that you're on your own way. Next is understand that you will fail often. The most successful titans of our time didn't just breeze through life quite easily. You know, if you take risks, you'll fail often. And realize through failure is when times, it allows you to, to reevaluate your life and reevaluate what actually do I need to do to do better. When you fail, you humble yourself. You go down to the bottom and you realize, okay, this didn't work out, but if I believe in this idea, if I believe in pushing people or something that I want to do, 
realize that that failure will only make you reevaluate how you do it better next time. Remember, take some risks. The most successful titans and the revolutions we talked about didn't happen just by chance. They happened because one person was brave enough to break through societal norms and realize, actually, we need to do something about this. So take some risks in life. Realize that without taking risks, if we look at people like Elon Musk, he had 40 million four years ago, and he decided to split it evenly between two companies, SpaceX and Tesla. He realized that if he split the money, the chance of failure was 50-50 per company. But now Tesla and SpaceX are revolutionizing technology only because he took the risk in his beliefs. Remember, through life, there will be, you'll face down the bullies. There'll be people stopping you. There'll be people saying, oh, why are you doing this? Or they'll slow you down. They'll talk behind your back, and you never know. But the one thing I need you guys to remember is once you believe in an idea and you surround yourself with the people who will push you, you don't have to worry about these bullies because they're nothing more than just a speed bump in the road. You have to remember that these bullies might come and go, but if you have the people that you've lifted, you have the people that are pushing you through, and you've gone through failures and risks, this will be insignificant. Remember, step up when times are toughest. When my granddad was eight, Ukraine was going through a period of Holodomor, where 12.1 million Ukrainians died of starvation. He, along with that, my granddad's father died through a World War II bomb. And so at eight years old, he had to look after the whole family in the village. At age eight, he had to walk six kilometers every single day to collect firewoods. Because they didn't have shoes, he had to have to wrap up towels on his feet and walk through 10 centimeters of snow six kilometers a day just to make sure that his family had enough wood to keep warm at night. Those were some of the toughest times. And I asked my granddad, what made you keep going? Why did you not stop if you had barely any food and you had to go collect firewood every single day. Why did you not stop? And he said, because I knew the next day or the week after or the month after might be better. And even though it was the toughest days, he said, those toughness, those risks I took to collect the firewood made me as a person. Remember, step nine is lift people up. In five, 10 years time, the same people you lift up now will be there with you through your toughest times. You know, it doesn't get easier when we get older just because we have a better job and we get paid more. You have to realize that by lifting people up now, if you have a friend who wants to achieve something or has ambitions, but doesn't actually have that support, you can be there for them. And that way, if you believe in that, that person will respect you even higher. So lift people up. Me and my friend Hamad in the audience recently launched our own charity to help kids from disadvantaged backgrounds believe in themselves through workshops, through skills, and through, through mentorship programs. And because the reason why we do this is we know these kids in five or 10 years' time might be helping us or mentoring us. They might be the next successful leaders of our time. And so if the nine points have just breezed by you, buckle in for the last one. Step 10 is remember, never ever give up. If you even take three or four of the 10 points that you've taken, you're on your way to achieve greater and be a better person than you were today. By just taking a couple of these steps, you can understand that you can achieve greater. And, and you, know, you might not make more money or you might not be more successful, but what you'll have is a fulfillment in life and encouragement that everything is okay, that you're sat with friends who support you and you're sat with people who want to push you to do greater. You know, those same friends that you're surrounded with by on these points, will make sure that you achieve your goals. And so, I want you guys to leave with one thought, is if you leave here thinking never to give up, and even taking one of those 10 points today, you're on track to become greater and better than you were today. I leave you with a quote from Elon Musk. The screen's a bit messed, but <laughs> the, it says persistence is very important. You should not give up. You should not give up unless you're forced to give up. Realize this, if you're passionate about something, if you have a vision to do greater, go do it. Go find a friend to help you do it, and you'll achieve whatever you want to do. Thank you very much, guys.
Thank you very much for that reminder, um, Andrea. That was um, really good, really hard hitting as well, and essentially condensing years of learning and years of research and self development into an 18 minute talk. So, thank you. That was um, a really good reminder. Um, our next speaker is a third year media and communications student with a passion for understanding the relationship between globalization and socio cultural theory. Asking the question, and it's a damn good question. Why does everybody speak English? Um, in a moment, we'll welcome, right now, welcome Zoe Maria Pace. Prinhanda, good afternoon. Firstly, I would like to say thank you for having me here. It's a huge honor. Secondly, I'd like to say it's so amazing to see what coming together and sharing ideas can do. Now, before I start my academic jargon, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Zoe Maria, or Zoe, and I have lived in nine countries in the past 20 years. For the first 10 years of my life, I moved about every two and a half years. I then moved to Singapore for six years, then Italy for two years, and this is my third year in Cardiff, Wales. Now, I often get the question, how did you manage all this moving? Well, to be honest, it was fine, because it was the only thing I ever knew. I did, however, sometimes feel a certain sense of uncertainty. I believe our identities are constructed by our experiences. We are paintings that morph and evolve over time. And brushstrokes represent the things we have lived. And a brushstroke in this time of uncertainty that was always constant was the English language. From the sky high rise buildings of Shanghai to the sandy beaches of Martinique, English was always there. Its presence was so omnipotent that even in the most obscure areas of the Himalayan mountain range, English was there, written on signs, leading us to safety if necessary. I mention this because it is important to recognize the prominence of English on a global scale. The subject is important because it excludes those who are not prominent in the language. If we understand how English is a form of cultural imperialism, we uncover a lot of the structural inequalities which are deeply embedded within our modern society. But before we understand how English has morphed into a form of cultural imperialism, we must first define it in its simplest sense, language imperialism is the imposition of one language on another language. The term has also been coined as linguistic nationalism, linguistic dominance, and linguistic imperialism. However, in this speech, the key cultural keyword through which I will define linguistic imperialism is R. Philipson's, where he says it is the reassertion and reconstruction of structural inequalities between English and other languages. This is to say, that linguistic imperialism is a hegemonic negotiation. Hegemony is a theory which describes how cultural products are used as a form of ideological control. The notion, originally developed by Karl Marx, later to be redeveloped by Antonio Gramsci, explains how institutional forms and material relation productions maintain the position of a social dominant class. The key point I want you to follow here is that within advanced capitalist societies, the perpetuation of class rule is largely achieved through a consensual means. This nicely ties in with Louis Althusser's theories of ideological and repressive state apparatuses, where he says that states no longer use repressive apparatuses such as militia, fear, policing, or terror to control its citizens, but ideological and cultural exports. This process has been intensified with the movement of cultural diasporas. The disruptor in my speech is globalization. Now, of course, where there has been the movement of people, there have been the movement of language, and there's always been a level of language imposition. We must only look to Western African missionary activities in the 17th century to see how language was imposed on people. But what differs historic uh, definitions of globalization to today's definitions is that the speed of which it happens no longer is globalization just the movement of people. It is the movement of people, things, and ideas across transnational borders. And, and this globalization is a factor in explaining why linguistic imperialism has intensified its presence. Just how like I, an Italian student, can simply book a ticket to China in five minutes. Therefore, linguistic imperialism has developed as a cultural mitigation. To further explain this notion, I use Cook's theory of the Torjan horse. Now, in the Kenokial version, the Torjan horse was a big wooden horse disguised as a gift, when in reality there was an army of men inside. English is the same. On a superficial level, it is a global language, a lingua franca. 
when in reality, it only reasserts and reconstructs the dominant power structure which perpetuate the ruling of a dominant class. To further this notion, I use the example of Pakistan. So basically, in Pakistan, there is a crisis because the government cannot supply the public demand for English. The article essentially said that policy welders and political elites sustain this notion. Essentially, Pakistanis see English as the key which unlocks the door to economic power. This is an example of how English is used as a form of social currency. Parallel to that example is that of Nigeria, where as a result of colonial history, English is one of their first languages. Yet, Nigerian students still have to take the international language exam. This is an example of how the hierarchization of language is parallel to that of race and ethnicity. Now, some may counter my claims and say, well, Zoe, actually, languages can organic developly amongst English and hybrid languages can be created. And I agree and I respect that because I know that we are not passive possessors of Western hegemony. However, even in these constructions, there is, a, there is a dominant power structure. For example, Hinglish. Hinglish is a mixture of Hindustani and English and, in, and can be seen as a reassertion of power because Indian nationals use it inside and outside the country to communicate each other. Essentially, it is given, giving back power to the people. But we cannot disillusion ourselves. To negate the very social political structures that created Hinglish would be to negate the very history of it. Hinglish was developed as a way through the 15th and 17th century for colonial masters to speak to their slaves. So actually by reusing the language, you are not asserting or giving power back. You are only exerting English's dominance and hold. It is what I like to call the invisible fist. To conclude, basically, English through various globalizing processes has intensified its presence. It has developed as a higher archetization of language and a social currency. But why do I speak about this today? The subject is ever more pressing in our geographical location and in light of political changes such as Brexit. The wider attack on the Welsh language probably represents the largest state-funded linguistic genocide. Welsh speakers still seek to achieve equal status in courts as cases can only be pleaded in English or French. Or we must only look to a few years back where children were made to wear wooden halters with the, letter, the letters WN carved on them. Or parallel to that, speaking, children who spoke the local language of Kiswahili were beaten with a stick and had to wear monitors. This is an example of how linguistic imperialism has forced people to betray both their culture and their peers. I was reading a study that said in 2019, they found that only 29.8% of the Welsh population spoke Welsh. How crazy is that? Cultural linguistic imperialism is so ingrained in our society that it has led to the near physical extinction of a language. This is because post-colonial thought has created the accepted common consensus that we owe nothing to the Welsh state to, own, to learn the language. It is a completely secondary and supplementary need. Now, of course, Cardiff University does combat that by, for example, having a School of Welsh, which offers two BA programs, a postgraduate research and a postgraduate thought. But yet, us students still perpetuate this myth. For example, why do we call Club e Forbach Welsh Club? I'd rather say it wrong 500 times than call it something it's not. Just how we don't call Italy land of pizza when it's just for a fact Italy. <clears throat> now, I do not have the agency or the solutions to give you a, a remedy to the world's post-colonial hangover. I can, however, tell you how to displace English at the center of the world narrative. And by displacing English at the center of the world narrative, we consequently displace Anglo countries at the center of the world narrative. And we recognize that English is not synonymous with economic power and development. So I have created a small, hand of a, a small number of handcrafted solutions for the teacher the employer and the student alike. Teachers, decolonialize your curriculum. To decolonialize and not to just diversify means to understand that knowledge is inevitably marked by power. To bring into minority texts means to bring into questions of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality all into play. And if we question the way we read traditional texts, we essentially understand that most traditional texts essentially give disproportionate prominence to the needs and uh, achievements of one social group. English is not a generic identity we all share. 
For Welsh teachers, how about introducing compulsory Welsh introductory classes to first year students? And if not that, how about exploring global problems through a Welsh perspective? Employers, to have a broken English does not equate to having a broken mind. Hire someone off their capacity to learn and invent. There are so many technologies available to us to make the language learning process easier. So why don't we implement those? Why do company hire someone who speaks English but no other languages, yet completely disregard the person who speaks, who speaks six languages but, no, but not English? For Welsh employers, why not make Welsh a first need on the CV rather than just a supplementary one? We will renegotiate and reshift its prominence in the business sphere. I see so many companies making blanket campaigns for an audience that is clearly not Welsh. You should be proud to differentiate yourself. This is a country with its own right, its own people, its own culture, and its own language. Let's be proud to be different. Students, learn a little bit about the world around you. Ask your friends how to say hello and goodbye in their languages and try to accommodate to their needs. If we do this, we start to understand that English is not something that, is, that dictates the way we see the world, and it is not the dictation of culture either. You have to understand that the world is not your oyster, it's everybody's. And that's why we should make this place an accommodating one and something that everybody can work towards. For Welsh students, simply stop cl calling Club EFO, uh, Welsh Club Club EFO back, vice versa, sorry. Or simply download an app on your phone which teaches you some Welsh. And even to add on to that, request institutional change. I believe the more we think about something, and the more we acknowledge, the more it actualizes. And when something actualizes, we can actually make a real impact and change. I believe linguistic imperialism is a big problem because language is the sole medium through which we communicate. It's a way in which we tell others we love them, in which we, tell, uh, in which we make economic, institutional, and social policies. Language is the most important thing we have. Alone, we cannot do anything. But together, we are a force. My name is Zoe Pace, and thank you for coming to my TED Talk, Vlog. Wow, Zoe, thank you. Some of those words I probably couldn't even repeat. You've made me feel quite inadequate as a host. But I think really, really important to reflect on um, our own identity, on the Welsh identity, and to think about language, something that you know, really we probably take for granted day to day, but to really think about where it's come from and what it means. Now, that was so much to take in that we're just going to have a short uh, five-minute comfort break. So we'll see you back after that for the next speaker. Thank you.
Hey, welcome back. I hope you're feeling refreshed. I hope this is working for the next speakers. So now we have a very special spoken word poetry performance from the African Caribbean Medical Association. My name is Christine Mahota. I'm Lara Kinawani. I'm Tomi Adole. And like mentioned before, we are from the ACMA committee. And today we're just going to tell you a little bit more, a little bit about ACMA before we get on to the spoken word. Um, so ACMA basically is aiming to inspire the next generation of African Caribbean students to know that they can go into healthcare courses as much as it, they're very misrepresented. And sometimes you, you lack that kind of person you look up to. So one of the aims is to definitely inspire people. We also aim to aspire, so we provide people who are looking to go into consultancy, looking to get into medicine, with mentors essentially. So you see whoever it is in the role that you want to be in. So we provide mentors to, um, to younger people. And we also aim to achieve increased representation of African Caribbean individuals within the NHS and the healthcare field, and to also encourage them to break down barriers that we currently are faced with as healthcare individuals. So um, just a little bit on that as well. ITV News did a recent study which showed that the number of reports from, of racism by NHS staff has almost tripled. Now, I don't know about you, but we know it's actually against the law to discriminate against race, gender, religion, everything like that. So we're here today to do a spoken word that is directed towards what it might be like to study medicine and be a woman and also be black. And we hope you enjoy it. Woman and black. Doctor and woman. Doctor and black. Doctor, doctor black, black, woman. Doctor doctor, doctor, doctor. We need a doctor. Is there anyone on this plane that can help? How can you be both doctor and black, woman? They told her step back. They asked for her credentials. What's at the top of differentials? Physician? Unlikely. They did not look like me. They did not speak like me. And yet, it only took me three years on this earth to realize that physician was what I was destined to be. It took you 10 seconds to disseminate 10 plus years of my training. I do not have my credentials, but this man's vitals are waning. They told her, step back. How can you be both doctor and black? I asked myself the same. And when they call my name, I will say, Tommy, not Oluwa Thomasin Adewale but you will be remiss if you thought I would divorce myself from my African bloodline. When I step into this white coat, I am more black than ever. I will remember the days when they laughed at my features. Broad nose, dark skin and kinks caused my confidence to shrink when they asked me, did they make it easier for you to get in here? Juxtaposed against these white walls, the message was clear. Woman, black, prestigious school of medicine, home to discovery of insulin. My existence in this lineage felt like insulin, managing the dissonance of my identity. Enigma, at the epicenter of diversity, cold switching with urgency, shedding the layers of culture off my tongue, carefully dissecting the vernacular. My speech became a disembodied phantom of my being that I failed to resuscitate. Cold blue and the deep hues of my skin remind me this is more like cold black, meaning there's an imminent threat, a suspicious object found on hospital grounds as if I don't belong. They asked me if I felt pangs of regret being the only black body in a sea of 259 students. They advised me Remain diligent, prudent, for the margins of error are insignificant when you dare to be both woman and black. When you dare to be opinionated, don't misconstrue your passion for attitude, your conviction for aggression when speaking on oppression. So be black, but not radical. My mother told me I need to work twice as hard to get four times as much. So I work four times as much to get half as much. So think logic, think practical, think 
woman, black, logic and training. My patience is draining when I instead deviate towards hypotheticals. What am I supposed to do when I encounter bigotry in this field and the condition is critical? How am I meant to deal with internalizing racism and sexism during rounds? When do I learn how to heal? Is there even an option? They told me, proceed with caution. For there's no form of training when navigating the coarse waters of medicine as women and black, doctor and woman. Doctor and black. Doctor, black, woman. Doctor, doctor, doctor. doctor. We need a doctor. Is there anyone on this plane that can help? How can you be both doctor and black, woman? I quickly say back because I know nothing else than to become composed in the face of doubt. To, to be, be fearlessly melanin when the world that begs, begs otherwise. And to be feminine. When my narrative is challenged and my abilities are called into question, we, we will stand at the intersection of our identities and we will say our very existence challenges what it means to be black. Breaks down the walls of oppression set up by our captors. And tears down the lines that we can be no more than BME. But truth is, we, we are, are changing, changing the world. We are human. We are women. We are black. We, we will be doctors and we will disrupt, disrupt the ordinary. Thank you. Powerful poetry, um, powerful words, and much, much needed work to be done to encourage more and more um, Afro Caribbean students into the world of healthcare. Incredibly inspiring. Um, I literally had goosebumps during that. I don't know about you guys. Um, our final speaker of today is CEO of Confused.com and graduated from university with a degree in history before challenging herself to become a fully qualified chartered accountant. With her talk, in order to be irreplaceable, one, irreplaceable, one must be, one must always be different. I can say a lot more, but please welcome to the stage, Louise O'Shea. Thank you very much. Hello. In order to be irreplaceable, one must always be different. This is something I learnt the day I was born. My name is Louise O'Shea, I'm the CEO of Confuse.com, and I'm going to talk to you today about this. The day I was born, my father was thrilled. Okay, he doesn't look like it in this photo, but in those first few seconds, he was over the moon. He exclaimed, it's a boy, let's call him Simon. And then he realized, Simon was missing something, a vital piece of equipment that would make him Simon. My father already had three daughters. Another one was not needed, it was not different. In order to be irreplaceable, one must always be different. 
It was actually Coco Chanel that said that, and I completely agree with her. I've never been very good at following rules. As a toddler, I didn't just climb out of my cot. You're all far too young to know about children. I have two. They climb out of their cots, but I didn't just do that. I climbed out of my cot, I went down the stairs, out of the front door, across the driveway that was covered in these really sharp little stones, and over to the neighbor's house. My mom should have known then that a daughter who can do that would not enjoy an institution like the Brownies. I had a deep desire to not to conform. I didn't want to do what people expected of me. That isn't something that was taught. It was something that was really innate. It was, it was deep in me. It was a deep desire to disrupt. Oh. So, this is me. I'm all dressed up, ready for the brownies. Do you know how long I lasted? One week. So my non-conformity, why? Why? We're going to talk about disruption. That's been the topic of your whole day. Okay? That's what you've been hearing about. I'm going to talk to you about disruption in my life. There is someone in the world, I know him, he's come up with the recipe for disruption, the perfect recipe. I'll tell you about him a bit later. But I've never been very good at following recipes. Feel free to come to my house, try my food. You'll realize I'm not good at it. I'm not good at following rules, not good at following recipes. So I won't give you the perfect recipe for disruption. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share examples about how I've lived my life. I'm going to share examples which, unknown to me in those early years, other people look at and they say, that was disruptive. And I'm going to tell you how in my later years, and there are a lot of them, I've actively sought to disrupt myself. So how did Simon, and how did that little girl who didn't want to be a brownie, get to stand in front of you today? Becoming a teenager is a horrible time. It is fraught with trying to find your identity, wondering whether you should conform. It's a horrible, horrible time. I grew up in the 90s in Yorkshire, where most teenagers would go to the shopping center or they'd go and hang out in a park. I didn't do any of that. I went to the town hall. I surrounded myself with middle-aged, probably older men, and I played chess. I didn't just play chess. I beat them. I beat them at chess. And why did I do that? I did it because I love to win, but I also did it because I love to pit a strategy against your opponent's strategy, and then I love to win. I've always been a curious person. I've always been interested in people. And at the age of 17, I decided I was going to go open my mind and I traveled, I very, very lucky. I had pen friends. That's before email. You wrote a letter, they replied. It took months. I had pen friends in Japan, and I went and spent time there. And I loved it. I loved the clash of traditional and modern. I loved learning how different cultures worked and how different Japan was to the UK. And I loved being free, free to try and do new things. So strategizing, winning, learning, experimenting, there's always a purpose to my nonconformity. We all know, and you hear it time and time again, the world is rapidly changing. Technology, social, economic, all these different trends are speeding up. You can't keep track, right? So you as an individual, how can you live you when you're working in a business, you when you're living whatever, your life, doing whatever you want to do. 
I believe that you need to have an edge. You need to have your own personal competitive advantage. And I believe that you need to be different because I believe that you want to be irreplaceable. And in order to do that, you need to keep disrupting yourself. Embracing difference means preparing yourself to be really uncomfortable. My whole life, I've tried to do things, challenge myself, push myself into things which are not comfortable. Things that make you feel nervous. Things that make you feel excited, though. But always things that you're super, super passionate about. And a young man was saying just that a few minutes ago. Be passionate about it and do something that you feel really proud about. In my early 20s, I worked, I traveled, um, lived all over the world, Eastern Europe, Asia, South America, Africa. I always wanted to go on to the next thing, see the next thing. And I think remembering my father's disappointment in not having a boy made me super passionate about women's rights and proving that women can do whatever men can and they can do it better. So in the early 2000s, I took myself and a team of women off to Zambia. We lived many, many months in different villages promoting women's rights. What did it give me? It gave me a real taste of leadership. Those moments of absolute joy when everything comes together. Those moments of utter, bitter disappointment when it goes wrong. All of it was a feeling that was truly addictive. So as I said, I read history at university. I used to organize charity fundraisers. Um, I used to work in the most popular bar in the city. Everybody at uni said, Louise is going into PR. That's where she's going. No way. I didn't do what people expected. Instead, as they said, I trained as an accountant. I pushed myself into a job which, on the face of it, is boring, it's quite dry, very spreadsheet heavy. But what I knew is that it would give me the knowledge I needed. Yes, it was uncomfortable, but I was going to learn something I needed to know to push myself forward. It was going to teach me something that would enable me to have a real impact in whatever I did. I believe that bringing together a combination of different skills, different experiences, different knowledge, that is what will make you truly different, which in turn will make you irreplaceable. So, my lack of fear, and my determination to prove that women can do whatever men can, and can probably do it better, meant that I was the first woman that the firm that I worked for sent to Sudan. I was working on the world's largest sugar refinery. I spent many, many months in extremely uncomfortable conditions. And I was determined to prove there was absolutely no reason that an international professional services firm couldn't have a woman representing them there. But after learning everything I wanted to know, and a hell of a lot that I really didn't care about when it came to numbers and professional services, I took a good, long, hard look at myself. Only fools don't change. It's another Coco Chanel, pearl of wisdom. At that time, I thought about what I didn't know. I thought about what I shied away from. I thought about what I didn't understand. And the answer came really quickly, and so did the opportunity. 
technology. Interestingly, the tech company that I went to work for, they conducted what is called a blind interview process. This is where, as the individual going through it, you have no idea what the company's name is. You don't know who they are. You don't even meet anybody from the company until the last minute. They pulled together a team of extremely diverse backgrounds. I worked with an engineer, an actor, a soldier. Yeah, it was incredible. They knew that in order to get a winning strategy, they wanted people from different backgrounds, with diverse knowledge, diverse skills, different experiences. And only that would help them to shape their strategy and their technologies of the future. For me, it was great. I learned a lot. I learned about robotics, cloud computing, virtual reality. It was really exciting, but something fundamentally frustrated me. And it was there that I kind of recognized that it isn't technology itself that disrupts. It's the inability of existing players to implement new businesses. And there, the opportunity is to truly disrupt. And technology enables these new business models. So when you think about that, think about what really matters to the customer. What really matters to you? And we're going to talk about a few of those businesses in a second. But if businesses don't adopt new business models that have got clear benefits for the customer, they're leaving the door wide open for people who do. So that, in my life, was when I met this guy. He's called Henry Engelhart. He's quite well known locally. He heads up, or he did, he founded a car insurance company. Now, car insurance is not something that anyone thinks about as being customer-centric. But Henry had a real deep passion for customer experience, for customer service. He was really focused on finding where the pain was and fixing it. So he founded a company, which is now FTSE 100. It employs over 10,000 people. It operates across the world. And it's because of Henry that Confuse.com exists, the business that I run. And Confuse.com is a fintech. We use technology to solve customer pain. And what did that mean? It means we change the way that people shop for insurance, for the way they shop for their insurances, their financial services, all of their utilities. We didn't just change it in the UK. We changed it across the world. We saved people billions of pounds across the world. Now, Henry, he didn't create that, right? He just funded the creation of it. The reason Confuse.com exists is because there was tremendous customer pain. And we were able to solve that with technology. And that, for me, is the sweet spot when you can bring these two things together. So when you think about those big topical disruptors that we all hear about, we all use, we all love, Airbnb isn't killing the hotel industry. It was the fact that you have limited availability and you have limited pricing options. That's what is killing the hotel industry. Netflix, it didn't kill Blockbuster. It was inconvenience, late return penalties. That's what killed Blockbuster. Think about the customer experience, the customer pain. And Twitter, it's not killing media. It's news that doesn't interest me. That's what's killing it. When I think about my business that I run, I think about it an awful lot. I want it to be irreplaceable. You need a business model that's going to be irreplaceable. You need these two things to come together for it to really, really work. You've got to solve a real customer problem. 
And I believe that technology enables you to solve that customer problem in many, many different ways, ways that we, that I, that you, we don't even know about yet. It is only then that you're really going to have an advantage. But you've also got to remember, things don't stay the same. The business model, which is irreplaceable today, is not going to be irreplaceable tomorrow. So, you've heard a lot about me, and I did that because I wanted to illustrate that throughout my life I've disrupted myself. In those early years, that's just what I did. But in the later years, I took a very proactive decision to do that. There was a, a time I was heavily pregnant. I am pregnant behind that card. Um, it was with my second child. This is Emmy. She doesn't always sleep like that. She was eight weeks old. And I got a phone call. I'd uh, applied for the job of CEO when I was heavily pregnant. In the interview room, they literally had to sit the table away from me. And when she was eight weeks, I got the call to say, you've got it. It's yours. I was stood in the kitchen, baby in one hand. It was dinner time, bowl of crunchy nut cornflakes in front of me. And I stood there and I made the active choice to disrupt my family, to disrupt my life, and to take on that challenge. Only fools don't change. So ultimately, I believe everybody deep down wants to be irreplaceable. And I know running my business, I want that business to be irreplaceable. I believe, as Coco did, that to be truly irreplaceable, one must truly be different. Embracing difference means that you need to be prepared to be very uncomfortable. You need to be prepared to break the rules. And you need to be prepared to challenge not just yourself, but everybody around you. So I've shared a few of my personal disruptions and experiences. I do believe strongly that you should Try to do things differently. But when you do, don't just do it for the sake of it. Do it because you have a purpose to it. I believe that businesses need a purpose to their disruption. And that's about making customers' lives better. I'm going to end by sharing a story that I love. It's about a llama. I'm hoping this story illustrates something which um, I think is incredibly important and I think maybe you heard about earlier on and that's about having um, your, mi your mindset, it's about having an open mind. Because when it comes to disruption, you need to be open to the opportunity. Okay? So this is a story, it was told to me by a guy, um, he's an incredibly entertaining, incredibly intelligent guy, he's called Bill O'Connor. Um, he's great. He works at a company called Autodesk, and you've probably never heard of Autodesk, but they will have had a hand in most things that you see, hear, touch, everything. They are a world engineering company, and they are behind many, many different designs and the ways of working, ways of doing things. And Bill has been, um, his whole job is studying innovation. So I told you there's someone in the world somewhere who has the perfect recipe. That's Bill. He lives in San Francisco, so he's a long way away if you want to go meet him, but he is on YouTube. Please don't watch it right now. I'm nearly finished, I promise, okay? So keep going. So, the story. I want you to pretend you're in a coffee shop and your friend introduces you to somebody. We're gonna call him Henry as a homage to my uh, former boss. So Henry is a dentist, okay? And he's telling you that he really wants to find a way to stop people getting nervous when they go to the dentist for a checkup. Don't know if you get nervous, but many people do. And Henry's got this idea. His idea, can you see where I'm going? Is to bring a llama into the dental surgery. 
So when you lay there on the chair and you're feeling a bit nervous, you look over, reaction to that. Is it A, that's crazy? Is it B, that is crazy, I'm going to tell all my mates what a nutter this guy is? Or is it three? You know what? That is really, really interesting. Would two llamas work better? You know what? I've got a mate who's got a horse box. We could transport the llamas in that. And if we get a bucket for the muck, that will really help. So I'm guessing most of you went with answer A. I'm going to go with A because B is a little bit bullying, so you know. Residents of Silicon Valley, which is home, as we all know, to the most successful companies on the planet, would have gone with answer C. There's something there about that open mind, the sincerity, the helpfulness, the openness. It's all a mindset. Right? There's nothing that stops a mindset from traveling. There's no cost to a mindset. There's no copyright to it. You don't need a passport, which is lucky, um, considering things going in America. There's no monopoly on wisdom or ideas. Anyone can have an open mind, and anyone can change. So if you do something different, if you take a risk, you might achieve something that you never thought possible. Disruption has been my way of life. It's been my mindset. Is it yours? So thank you very much for listening. It was an honor to be here. But I would like you to remember three things, OK? In order to be irreplaceable, one must always be different. Only fools don't change. And next time you're going to the dentist, don't be nervous. Just think of this guy. And I say, did you ever think Coco Chanel would share a TED talk with a llama? Thank you very, very much. Have a brilliant day. Wow, thank you Louise and what a fantastic lineup. I think we can all agree that um, disruption can come in many different forms and there are many ways to apply it in our lives to have extraordinary results. Um, I've got a few thoughts on the talks from the second half uh, which I would like to go through starting from, well, in the same order that you heard them in, I guess. First thing, knowing what to do is one thing, doing what you know is another. Secondly, micro steps, macro impact. A revolution starts with one person taking one step forward and letting their perseverance and passion push them the rest of the way. Mindset. Next, linguistic imperialism has intensified behind the backdrop of globalization. And a question here is, are we letting unique cultures and languages die for the sake of economic needs and potentially a lack of thinking outside the box? Um, another one, powerful words of poetry from, um, the, from ACMA and the wonderful work that they're doing, the much needed work that they're doing to encourage more and more Afro-Caribbean students into the world of healthcare. And last but not least, disruption isn't just about disrupting the world out there. It's about challenging yourself and being open to change, going against the status quo when you need to, and, and, sorry, and the expectations that are there of you uh, to achieve extraordinary, extraordinary results. Only fools don't change. Thank you, Mo. I think some beautiful themes coming through, particularly in Louise's speech just then, about continual learning. That's something that we can all take away. And being authentic, being true to ourselves, that's really important when we're thinking about disrupting the landscape. So none of this would have been possible without our sponsors. So we'd like to say a big thanks to Jimmy's Iced Coffee, Tram Shed Tech, and Modest Trends for their contributions to today. A big thank you goes out to all the student volunteers and the TEDx team 
who have helped to make this a reality. Without their time and their hard work, we, have not, we would not have been able to bring TEDx Cardiff University here today. And lastly, a massive thank you to all of you for being here today. And we hope that you've um, had some incredible thoughts from the ideas that were shared here today uh, to take away and work with. That's all for this year, but we look forward to seeing you again next year for another interesting topic. Thank you. Thank you.